Temple in Houston, Texas. We're so glad that you are joining us online for this special and holy hour of worship. This is the third Sunday after Pentecost. During this season, we focus on the life of the church and the reality of God in the world around us with an awareness of God's presence in all times and in all places. We use the color green to symbolize growth in our hearts, in our faith, and in our church. If you do not have the worship guide in front of you, pause this video now and go to baptisttemple.org, click online worship, and then click to read or download the worship guide. This will assist you in participating. This weekend, we celebrate Father's Day. A brief history of this day of honoring fathers can be found in this week's Temple Tidings. In short, it is important to know that the history of Father's Day is centuries old beginning in the Orthodox Church as the Sunday of the Forefathers. This special day is celebrated by churches and communities around the world and here at Baptist Temple, where we honor all who have been father in one way or another in our lives. If you are a father or if you have served in any way in your life as a father, today we honor you and we thank God for you and for your life. Would you join us in prayer? Almighty God, on this Father's Day, we give thanks for those fathers who have tried to balance the demands of work, marriage, and children with an honest awareness of both joy and sacrifice. We give thanks for those fathers who, lacking a good model for a father, have worked hard to become good fathers themselves. We give thanks for those fathers who by their own account were not always there for their children, but who continue to offer those children, now grown, their love and support. We pray for those fathers who have been wounded by the neglect and the hostility of their children. We give thanks for those fathers who, despite divorce, have remained in their children's lives. We give thanks for those fathers whose children are adopted and whose love and support has offered healing. We give thanks for those fathers who, as stepfathers, freely choose the obligation of fatherhood and have earned their stepchildren's love and respect. We pray for those fathers who have lost a child to death and continue to hold that child in their heart. We give thanks for those men who have no children but cherish the next generation as if they were their own. We give thanks for those men who have fathered us in their role as mentor and guide. We pray for those men who are about to become fathers. Lord, may they openly delight in their children. 
And we give thanks for those fathers who have died, but who live on in our memory and whose love continues to nurture us. Most of all, we give thanks for you, our Heavenly Father. We give thanks for your love, care, and we give thanks that you sent your Son to die on a cross for our sins. For it is in his name that we pray. Amen. owls and cemeteries may have in your mind, but I read an article a while back ago that, well, that suggested that those two things have been connected for centuries. In mythology, the call of an owl has been identified with the end of life. Native Americans have considered the owl to, to be the bird of shadows, the bird of darkness, and the bird of night. And for them, the owl is the messenger of death. In the British Isles, pagan Celts believed that owls were able to communicate with the dead, and, and their presence in cemeteries has long been seen as a sign of that supernatural ability. This is kind of odd stuff that probably doesn't have a strong correlation in your mind, but 
But the close connection between owls and graveyards is really no myth at all. The fact is, many owls live in the cavities of trees, and the old trees and cemeteries have often, well, they often have those largest hollows. In fact, people who study rare owls, they, they often look for them and find them in graveyards. More often than not, a, a place that we associate with death is this life-saving sanctuary for all kinds of species of endangered owls. Cemeteries, it turns out, they're really a, a terrific place for all kinds of, of life all around the world. Scientists are discovering that graveyards are some of the very best refuges for endangered species of animals and plants. And so it seems life is teeming among the tombstones. This is a reality that's being reported by modern science and by ancient scriptures. Today, the, the glorious truth that we continue to unfold from the book of Romans is that though we were sinful and dead by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, we are made to be alive. In the first five chapters of Romans, the, the Apostle Paul portrays this understanding of sinful humanity with total and complete depravity and he tells us that the justification of sinful humans it comes only through faith in Christ. In the previous chapter of Romans Paul has said that the, the magnitude of God's grace is tremendous and it, and it moves toward us. In fact Romans 5 20 says that where sin has increased grace abounded all the more. It's more than enough grace to overcome the sin that exists in all of us. No matter what the weight or the frequency or the magnitude of our sins, there is more than enough grace to cover it all. So we come this morning now to our passage for consideration, which is Romans chapter 6. We'll begin by looking at the first four verses. So Romans chapter 6, beginning in verse 1. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. So in response to this idea that where sin has increased, grace is abounded, Paul begins this chapter with a question so if that's the case, if there's more than enough grace to cover all of our sins, well then, should we just go on sinning? Is this a possibility? Well, a lot of people seem to think so. I think that we often see in so many Christians that we, we tend to have this very casual relationship with sin and this very casual relationship with God. They somehow feel like these two things are, are compatible and, and comfortable together. But that's not how it's supposed to be. Our, our lives are supposed to, to be different because of our, of our faith that we have in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, a familiar passage that says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. In other words, the true believer cannot continue in sin. So should we go on sinning so that grace may abound? Paul's response is an unequivocal no. In fact, the, the first part of verse 2 it says, by no means. No way may it never be. Absolutely not. Forget it. It's not possible. It's wrong. Actually, the words that 
we encounter here in this particular verse, they're ancient expletives. This is one of those R-rated sections of the New Testament. So whatever you consider the strongest way of saying no is, put that in this particular blank here. No way, Paul says. Paul's trying to correct a misunderstanding that some people had at this time. Some believers had interpreted the free gift of God's grace as an excuse to keep on sinning so that so that grace can abound. Grace is a good thing, and if the more that we sin, the more grace is needed, so we should keep on sinning. And then to be sure that he refutes this idea, Paul offers this statement as a, as a thesis for the following uh, section of Scripture. He says to them that we died to sin. How can we live in, in it any longer? His answer for why we can't go on, go on sinning is that we've died to sin. So how could it po be possible to, to live in sin any longer? Death and life, they're incompatible. If we died to sin, continuing to live in sin, it makes no sense. And that's not what the grace of God is all about. And what we'll see is that for most of the rest of this passage, what Paul does is he uses the, the concept of, of baptism by immersion as this wonderful illustration of, of, of what this looks like in our lives. Look with me again. Just let's look at verse 3 and 4 again. Do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus, that we were baptized into his death? Therefore, we've been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we might walk in newness of life. Now, baptism is not something that saves us, but it gives us a beautiful illustration of what happens to us on the inside when we believe in, in Christ's death and his burial and his resurrection. Our baptism by immersion, it drives home the, the fact that we have become dead to sin. Galatians 2.20, I'll talk about it more later in the service, but it says I've been crucified with Christ. We're, we've died to sin. The sin that used to characterize our lives is gone. That part of us, it died on the cross when we accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. But the image of baptism is important because it, it also reminds us that we've been buried with him through, through baptism into death. As a pastor, it's often been one of my responsibilities to, to stand at the graveside and watch a casket be lowered into the ground. And if you've, ever, if you've ever seen that happen, you know that there's a big difference between being dead and being buried. It's not until the casket is lowered and covered with dirt that, that the process of death is truly finalized. And this analogy of being buried with Christ in our baptism that Paul uses here, it, it's something that he intends to apply to our souls. In the same way that a dead body becomes a smelly health hazard if, if it's not placed in a grave, sinful habits, they'll They'll pollute the soul if they're not buried with Christ. I need to tell you, though, that in my opinion, being buried with Christ through baptism and his death, well, it's not quite as easy as saying the words on the page. Burial is a process, oftentimes. Sometimes burying our most excruciating memories and our unmanageable habits, sometimes that will continue for the rest of our lives. Some habits and some memories, they, they may not be laid to rest until we are. But by returning to our baptism, by thinking and praying on the meaning of it and relying on the healing that was made possible through Christ, I think it is possible for all of us to find some hope and peace in our struggle. Let us pray. Almighty God, Jesus traveled empty-handed through a brief life 
to invite us to be free. If those of us who seek to follow him are so weighed down that we can barely move at all. We carry with us the wounds of yesterday like weights on our soul. We carry with us our failures, sins big and small, and our regret for mistakes that were made along the way, and they're like anchors around our necks. We carry the dashed dreams and disappointments and our anger and our resentment against others. Even though it may be the result of something that happened long ago, we carry them like heavy luggage through the life that you've given us. We also carry with us our great accomplishments and the dreams that were realized that we pack them like trophies that we're unwilling to give up and our spirits are so wrapped around these things that we're not free to move. But we still believe in you and renew our commitment to participate in the work of your ever-expanding kingdom that is unfolding before us. We know that we will more fully realize the potential and the possibilities you've placed in our lives when we lean forward in hope into the horizon of your will and your way. So we ask that you would touch us Oh God, and make us ready to journey with you. Lighten our loads, lighten our steps, lighten our hearts, and loosen our grip on everything that we are afraid to lose and all that holds us in place. Free us to, live, to leave fear behind and to follow you boldly where you want us to go. Help us now to pray with an awareness of the words and the reality they represent as we pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
As we've already seen, Paul's used this image of our baptism as to, to help us understand one aspect of our identity in Christ that's demonstrated there in the baptism, and that is that we identify with Christ's death and his burial. And his, and his burial. Next, though, Paul will use our baptism to illustrate another aspect of our identity in Christ, and it, it'll be this time our, our Identification with Christ in his resurrection. Let's read together Romans chapter 6, now verses 5 and 6. For we, if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed. and We might no longer be enslaved to sin. Paul says we've been crucified with Christ. We have a oneness with Christ's crucifixion and we have a oneness with his resurrection. And our, our unity with that resurrection, it unleashes in us the same power that raised Christ from the dead. We share in the victory that has been won, not by resuscitation, but by resurrection. There's a difference between resuscitation and resurrection. Jesus was not merely revived or resuscitated. Jesus' body it entered a new mode of physical existence, which Paul saw as the beginning and a sign of the renewal of all creation transformation that happened to Christ's body in his resurrection is the same kind of transformation that should take place in the hearts and in the minds of those who are in Christ. It's not some kind of reworking of our old life. Instead, just like the historical Jesus who became the risen Christ on Easter, we receive from him and in him a life we did not know before. A transformation takes place. We're not quite the same as we were before. We are something new and different. This means an entirely new identity has the opportunity to spring up in us. Sure, we might have to live with the wounds and many of the struggles from our past, but there is a hope for something more, something different. Many of you know that I absolutely love baseball, and I've been a fan of the Chicago Cubs my entire life. Some of this, some of you have heard a hundred times probably, but I grew up in Midland, Texas, and in those days, Midland was the home of the Cubs AA farm team, and well, I got to see people like Joe Carter and Billy Hatcher and Sean Dunstan play in Midland while they were at the very beginning of their careers. So it made a lot of sense for me to be a Cubs fan in those days, and the Chicago Cubs have been a big part of my life ever since. However, I was well into my 20s before I ever visited Chicago. Chicago was a place I'd always dreamed about going to visit, and it was a place I knew some information about, but, but I'd never been there. I, I knew which state it was in. I knew approximately where it was located on a map. I'd watched millions of Cubs games on television, and from that TV coverage, I could recognize the Chicago skyline, and I knew that the city was located near Lake Michigan because occasionally they would show sailboats sailing out on Lake Michigan as they faded off to a commercial. Of course, I knew that Wrigley Field was there, the most sacred place for Cubs fans everywhere, and I even knew people who lived there. 
One of my roommates in college was from Chicago. Once I even got a postcard from there. But I'd never been there myself. And that wasn't okay with me. I really felt like I had to see Chicago for myself so you can imagine how much more spectacular seeing Chicago in real life was compared to my secondhand thoughts and images from, from televisions that were in my mind. Think about the difference here. I, I got to eat a hot dog at Wrigley Field. I took off my shoes and I stood in the cool water of Lake Michigan. I heard the bustling sounds of a city street. I saw the sun reflect off the windows of the Sears Tower, and I, I breathed in deeply the smog and the pollution of that great city. It was wonderful, <laughs> because now it was real. And I think faith is supposed to be that same way. Faith can be something that you have thoughts about. It can be something that you've heard about. It, it can be something that you've watched other people do. Perhaps you know roughly where faith is located, and perhaps you even know people who live in the realm of faith. Perhaps faith is something you desire, but you allow it to be distant and less than real in your life. Perhaps you're simply satisfied with the lesser kind of experience. Today, I hope you'll begin to realize that faith is something that you need to experience in a more real and vibrant way. You have been united with Christ. You have a oneness with Christ's crucifixion and his death and his burial. You have a oneness with Christ in his resurrection. And this unleashes that same power that raised him from the dead inside of you. You share in the victory that he has already won. Your life should reflect that. I hope that you'll take this unity in Christ that Paul is talking about more seriously. And I wonder if you would consider what would it be like to taste it? What might it be like for you to hear it and to see it for yourself? What might it be like for you to take your shoes off and stand in it? What might it be like for you to really deeply breathe it in? Perhaps if it became real enough to you, maybe, just maybe, a totally new and different identity might spring up in you. Amen. The Old Testament reading today comes from Psalm 86 beginning in verse 1. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am devoted to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all day long. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call on you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my cry of supplication. In the day of my trouble, I call on you, for you will answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and bow down before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We come now to a time of offertory, of giving back to God. We remember that all that we have is God's, and it is as an act of worship and with joyful hearts and out of an abundance of riches that we return now to God a portion of that with which he has blessed us. 
Although we are not meeting together in the temple, the church's operating expenses continue. You can be part of this ongoing ministry by giving your tax-deductible contribution. Go to baptisttemple.org and click Give Online or mail a check to us at 230 West 20th Street, Houston, Texas, 77008. Give cheerfully, thanking God for his blessings of light and life. During the offertory now, devote yourself to God in heart and in mind and in spirit. In this last part of the passage, Paul talks about being freed. Freed from what? Is it from temptation? Is it a freedom from a, a, a tendency to sin? No. Those demons will probably torment us as long as we live. Instead, Paul says that we are, are, we are freed from the power that sin has over us. Let's look at what he says, Romans chapter 6, beginning now in verse 7. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. That last verse here is so powerful. So also you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Again, Paul insists that what happened to Jesus, it also happens to those who are in him. Another way of him saying that this is sin and death, that they have been so decisively broken that, that Christians are no longer subject to it. We are free from it. It seems to me that, that Christ fulfilled his purposes here on earth and his death and in his burial and in his resurrection and that the best way that you and I can fulfill God's purposes for our lives is to identify with him in his death and his burial and his resurrection we need to allow Christ to make us truly alive truly transformed for him and for his purposes in our lives why it's 
because we consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This passage, it shines a bright light on that dangerous half-truth that God accepts us where we are. Sure, God does accept us where we are, but that's only part of the truth. God does reach out to every human and accepts them as they are, where they are. If, there were, if it were any other way, no one would ever be saved. But it's only part of the picture because grace is always transformative. God accepts us where we are and as we are, but he never intends to let us stay there. Because if that were what happened, then that would be what it looks like to continue sinning so that grace might abound. The idea that Christian holiness is going to just happen in our lives simply by doing whatever comes natural to us is just plain crazy. True freedom in Christ is not a random, directionless life, but giving ourselves over to the Lordship of Christ and knowing that this Lordship, it makes demands that, that are as testing and as difficult as they are liberating. I want us to think about this for just a moment together because I think this has profound implications for our lives. If we are dead to sin, if we are alive to God in Christ Jesus. Another place, in Galatians 2.20, Paul puts it this way, that we have, I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. We have to, we have to identify so fully with him that we consider ourselves to be, to have been a, a person who was crucified with him dead with him, buried with him, made to raise to walk in a newness of life with him. So we must be out in the world doing the things that nail-scarred hands would do. We need to be out in the world touching people who nail-scarred hands would touch. We need to be out there with nail-scarred feet going to the places that nail-scarred feet would go and willing to take a stand in those places that nail-scarred feet would stand. Why? It's because we identify with him in his death and his burial and his resurrection, and we have nail-scarred hands and nail-scarred feet, just like our Savior, and just like our Savior, we have been made alive to God. We have to find a way to let Christ live in and through each one of us. We have to seek a, a total annihilation of anything that, that prevents Christ from, from living in us and through us. And, and I'm not just talking about some, having some kind of spiritual pie here. I'm talking about an ongoing experience of, of living as the embodiment of the faithfulness of the Son of God who loves you and gave himself for you. Dwight Moody said one of my favorite quotes, he said that the world has yet to see what God can do with a man or a woman who has wholly yielded to Christ. The world has yet to see what, what God can do with a man or a woman who gives themselves completely to Christ. And I think we need to find ways to make ourselves completely and fully His. The truth of the matter is, Good, faithful, church-going people are oftentimes some of the, the least likely to give God everything because, because I think most of the time we think we're doing pretty well already. There have been those moments when I've been able to fool myself into believing that, that I've given everything to God because I said a few prayers and I read my Bible and I, I showed up at church. Perhaps you fooled yourself in the same kind of way. But the truth is, he doesn't want just a few little moments in our lives. He wants all of our lives, every part of it, every detail, every desire. He wants everything. There are parts of each one of our lives that we, we need to be willing to allow to die and to be buried in order that we might be raised to walk in the newness of life that comes through him. 
I'll close with this illustration. It's a powerful story about Alexander the Great who was leading a, a large and a great battle. And in those days, kings did not participate in the battle directly. They, they often would watch from a hilltop or some high place, and they would direct the movement of, of troops from the safety of that vantage point. And in the midst of a fierce part of the battle, a, a very young soldier became afraid and began to flee. He wasn't really running in any particular direction. He was just trying to run as fast and as far as he could away from the battle. Just as he had gone about as far as his legs would take him, unexpectedly, the emperor himself, Alexander the Great, came into view as the top of that last hill became level with his eyes. Alexander the Great sees this boy and he asks him, what is your name? The boy responds, my name is Alexander. It seems he had been named after the great emperor. And realizing that he was afraid and fleeing from the battle, Alexander the Great says to this boy, boy, either change your name or change your life. And I wonder if Jesus ever feels that way about us. After all, we carry that name Christian, and I, I wonder if Jesus, the Christ, if he ever thinks, I wish you would live up to your name. Either act like a Christian, or change your name. Because if you're going to identify with my name, identify with my death and my burial and my resurrection, if you're going to consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ, it should be evident in the way that you behave in life. Faith can be something that we've just thought about. It can be something that we've heard about or something that we've watched other people do. Perhaps we know roughly where faith is located. Perhaps we even know people who live in the realm of faith. Perhaps Faith is something that we desire, but for whatever reason, we allow it to be distant and less than real in our lives. Perhaps you're satisfied with a kind of experience that's less than what God intends for you to have. But today, I hope that you'll at least consider allowing faith in Christ to be something that's more encompassing and more comprehensive in your life. I want you to taste it and hear it and see it and take your shoes off and stand in it. I want you to breathe it in deeply because you have been united with Christ. You have a oneness with Christ's crucifixion, with his death, with his burial, and with his resurrection, which unleashes the same power that raised Christ from the dead. It unleashes that power in you. You share in the victory that has already been won. And your life should reflect that.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. May the Lord give you the grace to never sell yourself short, grace to risk something big for something good, and grace to remember that this world is now too dangerous for anything but truth, and too small for anything but love. Now may he take your minds and think through them. May he take your lips and speak through them. And may he take your hearts and set them on fire in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.